Murder Man. Hey, this is Bill Howe. Let's jump in my murder mobile, hit McDonald's, and listen to Murder Metal Mayhem. Spreading faster than a case of the clap in a trailer court. Able to shatter eardrums within a 666 mile radius. A podcast more brutal than all the rest. It's Murder Metal Right. Oh, what the fuck's going on, y'all? Hell yeah, man. Going down, uh, doing an episode tonight of some murder metal mayhem here at Horn's Eye. He was talking about his murder mobile. I mean, that's cool and all, but I'm still still gonna give it up for the murder. The murder Mac. I know that's what's so funny. Murder (laughs) Mac, murder mobile, probably inspired. So thanks to Bill Howell for doing that intro for us. Hell yeah. Episode one sixty seven tonight, guys. It's gonna be crazy. Chris, Joey here. With me, uh, we are getting ready for a little bit of snow, Chris. It's a little, get kind it of sounds crazy. like we're supposed to get a shit ton of snow. Yeah, they're talking like a foot or two, which our Winnipeg listeners are probably like, Whatever. hold my fucking beer, man. Yeah, right, man. probably. So, yeah, our Canadian friends are probably laughing at us. But down here, guys, we don't get that kind of snow very often, so it's a big deal for us. So yeah, it'll be interesting. All right, uh, Chris, what uh, what shirt you got on over there, dude? Oh, man, right when I took a bite. <laughs> <laughs> I got uh, the gorgeous shirt with the woman torso on it, just with the titties out. Wore it to work today, so it was good. Nice. Nice. Ooh. Yeah, you told that fun story about wearing that one to work. Yeah. So that's good <laughs> well, I was actually able to wear it to this work today, so. And you still got your morbid angel hat. Yeah, I still got it. Joey didn't take it back. That's good. That's good. <laughs> And Joey, it doesn't look like you got beat up or anything. You willingly gave him the hat. I willingly offered it. I'm rocking Murder Machine clothing shirt and the Murder Machine clothing fucking cinch bag. Hell yeah. But this shirt's pretty tight because my homie Nev from Chicago did the artwork and then I did the logo. So it's like both our arts together. Oh, very cool. Very cool. What you wearing? Uh, you know I love that shirt. Faces of death, man. I just got it uh, yesterday, and I was like, hell yeah. i definitely going to wear this one tonight yeah, from nasty, uh, Portland Distro. Definitely badass. I, that's what drew me to their website was I saw the Faces of Death shirt, and I'm like, oh, man. That was like my anointment into like gruesome, horrible shit, you know? Anointed and servitude. I think it was all of our fucking intro. Probably, yeah, shit. probably. Because it was really the first of its kind that I'm aware of. Like, you know? Yeah, like the real life shit, not like right. movie, movies or whatever. But right, like real right. Life shit, yeah. So, yeah, Faces of Death, old school. I got to give a shout out to our listener that I'm not going to say his name. I was going about to say it. But he came out and gave us a fucking batch of this honey. And That's fucking so me and good. Chris are fucking eating it. Did he make that? Yeah, yeah, he made it himself. He gave us this and some caramel. But uh, yeah, me and Chris ate some of this earlier. We're just eating some right now. So so it, this episode could get very this interesting. This episode could be pretty fucking out there. <laughs> <laughs> well, very cool. Always nice when our listeners send us stuff. Now, don't send us that because, you know, that's like a federal crime. Yeah, don't send it. Don't do that. Yeah, but, yeah, don't do that. You know, Pop-Tarts, you want us to throw a Pop-Tart? Bands, Still if waiting. you want to send us some stickers, we'll put them on the table. Yeah. P.O. Box 554, Hayworth, Illinois, 61745. All right, last week, guys, we did a brutal rewind on the Zodiac Killer. Uh, that was one we did, Chris, originally episode 11. Hard to imagine that far back, but. That was a, yeah, and June 2018. Me, I knew man. it was a long time ago, but once you told me like how long ago, I was like, "Holy!" Fuck, I know man, it's what? it's crazy. Time flies, uh, but there's been some recent news with that private organization that claims to have solved that 50 year old mystery. So that was last week, and uh, we talked about it. Go listen to it. Yeah, it's a different format than our typical. There's no metal. There's no mayhem. It's just one topic, and it's one we've already done, so we're kind of catching people up on what's new. Yeah. So we did that, and we did double duty. We did a Patreon-only episode, Joey, on uh, a good one, a nice iconic story. People are checking it out, so. Hell yeah. Manson family, Manson family. Uh, definitely a good one, uh, but you got to belong to that 666 club to, to listen. Yeah. 
So check the episode description. If you are not a member, we are getting a few new ones every day. It's really cool. And you can go listen to it right now. You can, exactly. Because I'll email you right back with the link to yeah, it. So stop listening listen to right this episode. <laughs> yeah, pause, <laughs> this. pause this one. Go and listen to the Patreon episode. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Or at least just sign up for the Patreon. And then listen to it Cue the episode up after there this one. There you go. Yeah. There you go. All right, so that was last week, and uh, we were passing 800 listens to the Brutal Rewind when I checked today, so that's pretty good, and so thank you to everybody that's already heard that. Hell yeah. All right, tonight, though, guys, we got a sick one. We're going to Connecticut, me and Joey's old stomping grounds. Oh, yeah. Um, Going to Connecticut. CK's uh, old stomping grounds. Yeah, CK's (laughs) old stomping grounds for sure. Uh, We have done one other... Connecticut episode, Chris, the iconic episode number two, uh, uh, Mr. Woodchipper himself, Richard Crafts. <laughs> that was brutal. Uh, that's episode two. That's crazy to think. Yeah. I remember that doing was that in the one. very beginning. Let's get an orange fucking coat out in the snowstorm. Fucking, <laughs> yeah. What the fuck? Fire man? up the wood chipper. <laughs> so, yeah. So we're going to be talking tonight about William Devin Howell, uh, also known as Bill Howell. Uh, or he called himself Chris the Sick Ripper. Ripper. That's kind of cool. Kind of funny. Give yourself your own nickname. (laughs) Yeah, it's kind of goofy. But he's not a big name in true crime, so I bet a lot of our listeners are not going to have much idea about this guy, which is great. He has got the highest body count of any Connecticut serial killer. He brutally raped, tortured, and murdered six women and one man from January to October of 2003. That's a short time for that many people. Yeah, man. 10 months of just brutality. Uh, he buried them in shallow graves in the woods in a place he would call his garden, which is fucked up. And so, yeah, this 10-month reign of terror Body and garden. disgusting rape van. We're going to get into it. It's a murder mobile. Hell yeah. Maybe a rip off of the Murder Mac Joey. I don't know. <laughs> So we'll do that it's, in the It's the East segment. Coast version. That's right. That's right. Yeah, it's like a West Coast, East yeah. Coast thing. Uh, Joey, you got the horns tonight, dude, in the metal segment. What do we got going on there? Uh, we're doing fucking Waco Jesus. Fuck. Yeah, which, yeah uh, man. I'm excited to be doing that. They're from right here in our area. Yeah, Low 12 played with them a couple different times. Hell yeah. Fucking just badass, brutal fucking death grind band. Yeah. Uh, did interview with a guitarist. Yeah. Play part of that. Uh, I know it's already fucking available to the Patreon people once right. again. We're going to make it available the day after this drops, right? Yes. Uh, but that will be pretty cool. I think it was like 25 minutes or something. Yeah, I think it was 27 minutes with the song on oh, it yeah. at the end. And, uh, yeah, so we're going to play a piece tonight, about six minutes of it, and then the full interview the day after this awesome. episode comes out as Hell a yeah, bonus. Man. So that was really cool, Joey. Chris, you got a Lost Classic yes, for us, I so that'll one. be awesome. And that'll be our metal segment, so that's cool. Uh, killer Cage Match tonight, guys. Always a favorite of our listeners. We got uh, listeners that contribute some random <laughs> numbers so we could decide who's fighting to death in the cage. Chris, yeah, who do we want to thank got, tonight? We want to thank you, fucking Bo Keating. Rebecca Boomsock once again. Hell yeah. And, and the one and only Laura Kovacs. That's so right. Yeah. right, man. That's Hell right. Thank you, guys. Mrs. CK over yeah. there. So she's still doing okay. I talked to her just recently. Uh, she's doing okay at the new place, and she's awesome. trying to get Good. used to new the transition. way. But, you know, yeah. it's tough losing a husband yeah. uh, or spouse, you know, uh, for you know that you've been with for a long time. Hell yeah, glad she's doing good. Yes, and it's always nice we get CCK in here looking over us, making yeah. sure that we're safe, keeping those posers away. Uh, now tonight, we got a good one fighting in the steel cage. Joey, who do we have in it tonight? Uh, we're going fucking pretty much East Coast with it. Fucking yeah. Up. But we're going to have Son of Sam, David Berkowitz, yeah. 44 caliber killer. He's going to be going up against the fucking mobster. And we don't talk a lot of shit about no, him. No, we don't no. talk shit but, about But him. Tommy Karate. Hell yeah, Tommy's going to bring it, You might automatically it, win this so we don't get our ass kicked. <laughs> Tommy's going to bring it, man. I'm, I'm definitely excited because Berkowitz is that chubby behemoth, you know. Right, so. just kind of lurking around. I don't know if he's going to stand the chance, but mm-hmm. always with the objects and Well, I know one of the objects ain't a 44 caliber bulldog. <laughs> That's true. Right, That's there's true. That. <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, Berkowitz is going to have to get creative to keep down Tommy's 
fucking spinning back kicks to fucking knock his ass down. <laughs> I added five more killers and five more objects and nice. a whole new set of variables tonight. So fucking right. be good. Um, also, we were contacted by a former Australian federal police officer, which is their equivalent of the FBI. Uh, he's a big fan of the show. He is a 666 Club member. Um, he's actually given us more than our $3 a month monthly fee, so we really appreciate that. And he said we did a really good job on the Ivan Malat episode, Chris, so that was cool. Fuck yeah, Australian stories. Was that the one where we ate the Vegemite and we're drinking Fosters and shit? I think that was a, Malat that we did that. Yeah, that yeah. was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Malat. All right, yep. so I thought so. So that's funny. He, he heard all that stupidity yeah. and still thought we did okay. That's so. awesome. Um, I, I got a, I got a quick bit of news that I just wanted to say real fast. Yeah, <clears throat> we just did our new Patreon and we did it on the Manson family, and this popped up in the news the other day, and I thought it was pretty interesting. But Jeff Franklin, who he was the creator of Full House, right? Okay. Right, his name used to pop across with the fucking yeah, the, yeah, the bridge. Sounds and shit. familiar. Yeah. Anyway, Jeff Franklin, he had a uh, Beverly Hills mansion. That he had for about 15 years it was built in 1996. Uh, and he is selling it. It's fucking for sale right now. But why this is interesting is because it's on the plot that 10,050 Cielo Drive was at oh, where, wow. where the Sharon Tate murders happened. Right. So it's not the same house because I was but raised, it's, the same, but the, it's spot. the same spot. Interesting. Yeah, and that house is for sale right now, and the owner is Jeff Franklin, who created Full House. That's crazy. Anyway, I just thought I would... Yeah, yeah that's that. kind of a weird coincidence. <laughs> so, yeah, so we got this Australian federal former uh, police officer in Australia he wants to come on. He wants to have a cool nickname like Tex. I thought Vinny Vegemite might be cool, but then Chris, you came up with a better one. <laughs> yeah, fucking Dundee, man. Just call him Dundee. So <laughs> we got a, a new guy. I'll have to run that by him to make sure he's cool right, with it, but right. I'm sure he is. He's an avid listener Hell yeah. uh, to us, so that's amazing. Somebody of that, you know, credentials uh, in law enforcement loving some murder metal mayhem, so that's really cool. Hell yeah. And the fact that he's a, a 666 Club member is even cooler. Now, thanks to everybody out there listening to us here at Murder Metal Mayhem. We keep seeing the numbers rolling in. Guys, a big one last week, 3,600 listens. So thank fucking you very a. much. Y'all are the shit. That's up 1,200 from that's the week before. Awesome. So that's pretty amazing. We've been trying to crack that 3,000 mark uh, for the last six months or so. Um, Getting there. And boom, tell your just friends. blew it up. So thank you. <laughs> Hold on, I got one more thing I got to tell you guys too because I forgot about this till just now. Okay. So my girlfriend's from the four one nine, right? And her and her mom are you know they're big listeners yeah. to our show or whatever. Her mom <laughs> had sent her a text, and she said to me, and "I fucking it's so funny." <laughs> she said, "She said, listen." I had a client today from Finley. She's a teacher, and she had one of Sherry Brooks' sons in her class. No oh. way. Back when Sherry could walk, she'd show up in long night shirts, not <laughs> sure if she had any shorts on, and she would say, a day without sex is like a day without sunshine. <laughs> that was Sherry <laughs> oh, Brooks' Oh, my stuff. God. <laughs> Damn. I was like, that's so funny. I was like, I'm going to fucking... <laughs> so I'll credit that to Peggy Sue, who wow. listens to who the, the show. Who the hell was Lately doing Lately. that? Oh, man. And her feet and everything. Oh, yeah. That's rough, no. man. That's Sherry rough. Brooks, though. I was like, Get that's the fuck hilarious. Out of here. That's hilarious. Well, Chris, Joey, we got a lot on our plate tonight. We're going to be taking a trip east to the Constitution State of Connecticut, and hopefully, we'll stay out of another rape van. And some crazy dude with a mullet <laughs> praying on <laughs> prostitutes. So. Fuck yeah, let's get our fucking murder on. Hell yeah, talking about Australia, how about some in Malice's yeah. Wake, man? Always some fucking badass. Religious Holocaust, so brutal. From their latest, The Blindness of Faith, one of my favorites. It was my top album 
when I did it uh, in 2020 from 2019. So right. really, really good stuff. Love those guys. All right, we're going to be doing our feature tonight on the prolific serial killer from Connecticut, the sick ripper, William Devin Howell. His hmm. brutal and horrific crimes went down, as we said, over a 10-month period in 2003 in New Britain, Connecticut, which is kind of by uh, Hartford. Um, and he murdered six women and one male, uh, all prostitutes and or drug addicts. Everything he- in Connecticut's by Hartford. That's right. right. Yeah, that's it's true. So that's small. true. They, you could swing a cat and hit every town in Connecticut. Because, um, yeah, I lived on the very western edge of what, Connecticut. Did you just and say I you was could only swing a, a cat? Yeah. <laughs> that's a Luca Magnata shit right there. <laughs> but, yeah, I was only an hour from Hartford, I think. And right. that's, you know, pretty good distance, but the state is so small. Right, right. Um, so yeah, so this is going to be a good one tonight. He had a righteous mullet, Chris. Yeah, that's, that's pretty dope. dope. <laughs> that is pretty dope. Uh, also a horrible story and one hell of a violent run for this sick son of a bitch. Another rape van, uh, <laughs> the murder mobile. We could have a whole fucking, uh, a fleet of fucking that's murder, right. murder <laughs> mobiles. <laughs> that might be a good I mean, commercial I would put Joel for Rifkin's a rental. In there without I'll, the fucking... A van uh, rental commercial. Oh, yeah, that would be that's good. That's a good one, yeah. Yeah, but yeah I'd put Joel Rifkin in there. It, his vehicle without the fucking... Uh, he had the with truck the, with the topper on and, it. And the missing the fucking... Missing license plate yeah, light. Right, <laughs> there you go. No, he, had, he did. He had a classic car. Yeah, that's funny. Bundy's fucking Volkswagen. The Volkswagen. That's true. Yeah, that's all right, true. all right, back on top. <laughs> yeah, Ed Gein's car. Yeah, fuck yeah. Uh, so Chris uh, CK was the one who originally thought up of uh, William. We're gonna have Devin a killer Howell. cage match, fucking yeah. demolition derby one day. <laughs> yeah, so <laughs> it's like the fucking golf cart mosh pit. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, so CK uh, he would have liked uh, hearing us do this one. Oh, so yeah. this is cool that we're doing it. Uh, Joey, Connecticut, not really known for serial killers, but this guy is pretty damn brutal. And as Chris mentioned, just a short span of time. Yeah, I mean, it killed quite a few. A, a 10 month period of just fucking violence, you know? Right. On the other hand, you're doing it in a fucking tiny ass town like that. Who the fuck ain't paying attention? And, uh, for right. real. You know, and it's not like fucking the streets of fucking New York, something like that, where there's just all this crime running rampant. Right. Like, this is Connecticut. Right. I don't know. It's it's a different situation. So it yeah. was a short, quick, furious fucking rampage. Right. But it is kind of weird that it wasn't noticed a little more, maybe. That's, that's a good point, man. <laughs> now, I was born in New York and raised in Bethel, Connecticut. Joey, what part of the state were you from? Uh, I was born in Saybrook, but I lived in Waterford, Connecticut, okay. which is on the southern shoreline. Okay. Uh, yeah. Like I said, everything's fucking... Yeah. A, a cat's throw away <laughs> from fucking Hartford. <laughs> so I never knew about this guy because I moved out here in 1990. So this was long after I was out here. Uh, but I'm sure most of our listeners that are not familiar with Devin, William Devin Howe will be tonight. Hell yeah. Um, and I always like doing these ones, Chris, you know, these obscure ones that, that people don't know about. Definitely. I love doing the ones that, like, even, like, when we we find one, it's just like, holy shit, what the fuck? Yeah. Like, how did I not know about this shit? Exactly. I was just watching a documentary in the house of one that I texted it myself. I'm like, this is a must do an English serial killer, but yeah, Hell pretty yeah. brutal. Uh, so yeah, always finding new ones. I think we are at our best though, when we're doing a topic that isn't well known and we totally dissect it, dig in and come up with tons of info. And like you said, Chris, even learn ourselves, because if you go to Wikipedia, there is not much on this guy, basically right. the victims, a, a few of the timeline things, but none of his childhood, None of the other stuff that's going on. And uh, so, yeah, I mean, if you're one of those podcasts that just phones it in, you're going to miss the boat on this uh, case for sure. Now, William was born 1970 in Hampton, Virginia, to parents Melissa and John. Uh, He's the youngest of four boys. Uh, His mother was 40 years old when she had him, so back... In 1970, that was a much bigger deal. Fucking whore. (laughs) That would have been called a geriatric pregnancy. So pretty dangerous, a woman of 40 years old back in 1970 
having a child. I mean, even today, yeah. that would be a thing. Yeah. Uh, so very risky. Uh, but when she gave birth to William, the oldest boy was fighting in Vietnam. So she had quite the span. Between the kids. Yeah. Might have been an oops uh, situation. Like, God damn it. Did you just come in me? Fuck. <laughs> <laughs> So there was a, a big age gap between the, the oldest and, and the youngest, which would be William. Now, Chris, in the case of this guy, very normal childhood. Yeah, his childhood seemed pretty legit. Like I said, his yeah. mom and dad both worked. They were, like, disciplinary, but not, like, out of control. Right. Like, got punishment for when he did shit wrong or whatever when he was right. super young. Like any of us got. Yeah. Right, but not, like, the beatings or tortured or right abused or watching anything his like mom that. have sex with yeah, random nothing people. like that nothing it was a pretty like normal fucking thing <laughs> uh but btk i mean we've done some of these chris where you know pretty normal upbringing like btk and obviously he turned out pretty fucked up so i don't know i just think it was his own his mentality fucking i don't i don't know why yeah i don't know there's something in his brain that just said fuck it i'm gonna start killing shit <laughs> right and it started, the thought started very early. Yes. Like yeah. something about, I don't know, man. Yeah, it's fucked up. Now, he was going to church as a young boy. His aunt would take him to church. He's very involved in sports, local boys club. He had the paper out, just very normal stuff. Uh, but it is unbelievable how a guy like this could turn out so fucking whacked. Uh, things would change when he turned 12 or 13, when his mother was diagnosed with breast cancer, he had a really hard time dealing with that, and he turned to alcohol and weed to self-medicate. When he was like in 12, 13, 14 years right, old. Right, going to he's school. He's like going to school drunk up. and shit, like fucking Dahmer. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like yeah I real. mean, he was doing this shit at a pretty young age, and she was the stability in his life. She was that... As you said, Chris, that disciplinarian helped him stay on the straight and narrow. And he also talked about how his mother would ask him to bring her his dad's gun so she could kill herself when she was sick with cancer. Just didn't like going through the That's pain rough. and shit. But, I mean, he would say it hurt him to see her like that, but he just couldn't put that gun in her hand. I mean, I don't that's think fucked any up. fucking kid would, though, man. Like, oh, that's If you tough, look at your freaking... Tw- I couldn't even imagine looking... My daughter, my youngest daughter's 12. I couldn't even imagine looking at her like, hey, go get the gun so I can shoot myself. Right. Are you serious? No, she'd, she'd be like, let me do it, Dad. Yeah, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> can I take a picture of it? Yeah, come on, man. Like doing- mayhem? Yeah, that's what I was going to say. We're about to do a black metal up band anyway. Come on. <laughs> now, Joey, that's definitely some rough shit for a kid to deal with, but, you know, using drugs and alcohol to self-medicate is something a lot of teenagers do but they don't all turn out to be serial killers oh absolutely they don't and and as far as from where i was sitting and people who i knew most teenagers did that shit and fucking i don't know anybody knowingly that turned out to be a serial killer that i was friends with so i mean that's a lot of people that get high that ain't fucking killing so yeah for sure (laughs) you know it's funny too Speaking of getting high, like Pete brought these fucking so them religious stickers, and I stuck this one, and it's just a heart that says Jesus in the middle of it, right in front of me, like just because there was a spot on the table. But now it has become where I break up my one. weed, <laughs> right oh, on perfect. Jesus, yeah, right that's on Jesus. Funny. He gave it to us, man. You see what God just gave see to what us, God man. Just gave you, man. <laughs> So, yeah, so definitely some crazy shit. Um, But his mother's cancer fight would go on for a while. His dad was working extra hours to help pay the the increased medical bills uh, because she wasn't able to work anymore. And this gives William all sorts of free time, and he would continue to drink and smoke pot and spend time with his girlfriend, Mandy. I'm not sure if that's the Mandy that Barry Manilow wrote the song about, but nonetheless... I mean, I doubt it because this is after that. (laughs) (laughs) I didn't see how old uh, he was when his mom died, but he was a teenager, I believe. Um, And he had the Madonna whore complex. Again, anybody listening that is not naming a band that is (laughs) missing the fucking boat. Madonna (laughs) whore complex. That would be an awesome band name. So... You could just, you know, thank us here yeah. if you use that. Yeah, you know? there you go. So he has this Madonna whore complex, which means women are either totally good 
or totally bad. There's no in between. Right. So it's kind of like how uh, like Gene's mom thought like, exactly like that. Like, yeah, but, but this is his thoughts, not his mom's thoughts. Right, so like, right. Slutter a saint. Slutter a saint. Yeah. <laughs> Now, Chris, when William turned 14, his hormones are fucking raging. And it's because he found... he's high all the time. He's just like, how can I make this better? Yeah, how and what was his go-to, so he... man? He got obsessed with something. He decides he's going to steal his fucking dad's car one night and fucking cruise down the street and go get a fucking prostitute. Right. He's, he's 14. He's 14. Man. Did you see the pictures of him when he's 14? Yeah. What fucking... <laughs> Like, seriously, dude? Like, you look like you're fucking... 12. 12. You look like you're 14. Right. <laughs> like, fucking yeah, 12. Yeah, stealing his dad's car goes... But that's the cleanest John's them whores ever had. Right. That's like, true. Yeah, <laughs> about to soil him. Fuck. Yeah. Trolling for prostitutes. Well, he got, yeah, he got stuck, though. He's like, I like hookers. Yeah, blowjobs from prostitutes. That was his thing, man. Fuck. Um, but not a good thing for a 14-year-old kid to be doing, stealing his dad's car and... Picking up hookers. Fuck it, man. I mean, I took the car a couple times when I was a kid, but I didn't give it no hookers. (laughs) Should have. (laughs) In Fairbury, there were hookers? No, there was no (laughs) hookers. I mean, it depends on what you term a hooker is. Right. right. You'd be better off going to Pontiac. Yeah, 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 for sure. Shit's whack in Pontiac. That's what Meister and I always used to say. Right. Now, Joey, it would be this addiction to prostitutes that we've seen. Other ones like your boy Rifkin, yeah. uh, Cottingham, Shawcross. I mean, this is a thing. But what is the deal with that? What's the psychopathy behind them going after these prostitutes? Yeah, you know, I feel like the, the dudes like uh, him and also like Gary Ridgeway. I feel like they weren't very good at connecting with the female right. gender. Right. They they wanted to and they liked them, but they had no way to fucking do Awkward. it. Awkward. The only way they could do it was to pay for it, and right. it was it was easy. Uh, it was a transaction; like you could go home, and be done with it, right? And not think about it. But as with Ridgeway, fucking uh, Howell, like you said, the Madonna whore complex. So you're hating every one of these bitches that you're sleeping with. Right, because, because they're you selling think their body for drugs. Yeah, you think that they're fucking worthless whores. Yeah, you, you wouldn't take them home shit. to your mom, you know right, what I'm saying? Right, Uh So you're not in love with any of them. You actually hate them all, and you're around them all the time. Then, you know, eventually that fucking anger fucking swells up in certain individuals like this. And right. Take their lives. Yeah, it's crazy, man. Um, Howell would tell Ann Howard, who wrote the book called His Garden about the crimes. Over there, they say his garden. His garden. garden. <laughs> That's more Boston. It is. So okay. much you're right, you're Maybe right. a little bit of it. Um, so uh, he estimates he had gotten sex from prostitutes hundreds of times um, since his first experience at age 14. Uh, despite all of that, he stays with Mandy. And she had two children by him. Lucky her. I, I think he was only 16 or something. The something first like time that, she got yeah. Pregnant. Uh, Howell told his biographer that he didn't want to talk about them. So he got kind of weird talking about the kids. He never knew them. And Mandy split up with him, winds up getting married to someone else, and moves out of state. So good for Mandy. Oh, that's yeah. for sure. Having that foresight of like, this yeah, isn't going to go anywhere. This good. fucking mullet dude is fucking freaking me out. I'm out of here. <laughs> Very good move, and hopefully those kids grew up and have no fucking idea who their father is. Uh, He had fantasies, though, about raping prostitutes and only killed his victims to cover up his crimes. Uh, He would tell the biographer that he would slip into what he called catnaps during the time he kept his victims. Didn't we just do that with Cleveland Strangler, where he fell asleep with them all the time? It's so weird. Yeah. Um, then he would wake up and rape them repeatedly and then go back to sleep again. So very strange. Fucking 12 hours. Yeah. 12 hours of this shit. And he would drive the van around to different places so he wasn't in any one place too long for right. too long. So pretty fucked up. As a teenager, Howell is drinking way too much. He ends up with two DUIs. And a driving on suspended license, which is not good, Chris, right? I mean, I've done that before. It's not, it's not good. It's not good, no. Uh, he loses his license for 10 years when he's 18 years old. So what the fuck? 
Uh, he continues to drive using stolen license plates he got from motel parking lots. He said he liked the the Florida plates, Joey, because they don't need a safety sticker yeah, in Florida. I mean, yeah, so. they didn't need the emission sticker back then. And right. Fucking, he was like, you know, that's one less thing to worry about. Yeah, because Connecticut had the emissions. Oh, I yeah. remember having to do that. Uh, he bounced around from Virginia to North Carolina. Uh, with his mom gone, he kind of lost all sense of direction. So Chris Howell finds love in an internet chat room in 2001 with a girl from Torrington, Connecticut, and that's how he ends up there, man. Uh, yeah, but he lived in Virginia for a minute, but not long, but got fucked up driving, fucking drinking without a license. <laughs> yeah. So he, he's, just oh, like, he's like, I don't give a shit. <laughs> Cruising. Yeah. I got my beer. I got my music. I got my lady. Let's fucking do this, homie. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> so that's how shit. he gets a little taste of Connecticut there from this girl he met in this internet chat room. And Joey Howell would claim that he fucked up by getting those DUIs and losing his license. And he thinks things would have turned out a lot differently if he didn't. What do you think? I mean, I don't know how the hell he expected them to turn out much differently because he was already fucking, you know, fist deep with fucking committing crimes right sexual deviancy it's in his it's in his mind he's fantasizing about yeah it. i mean his right. his escalation is already there to where i feel like the outcome was gonna be what it was regardless if he had fucking lost his life yeah i mean it definitely doesn't help when you can't get around without yeah. stealing a cars or getting license plates in right. parking lots but but i agree i think he was kind of heading for that like chris it, mentioned yeah. it was just something in him that just wasn't right, you know, and it wasn't in his upbringing, that's for sure, at least from what we know of it. Now, things did not work out with that girlfriend. Howell ends up getting an apartment, but his roommates are heroin addicts. Gotta that's not that. good. <laughs> that's the best kind of fucking... Dude, that's the only kind of roommate to have these days, bro. Yeah. I mean, that's probably a prerequisite for Shawback. No. <laughs> he ends up having to leave that situation, decides to move back to North Carolina, but when he stops to get some gas for the trip, he flirts with the girl behind the counter, asks her out on a date, and she fucking accepts. And that's what makes him decide to stay in Connecticut and live in his van. I mean, this is down like by the, the river van by down by the river. I, I don't believe he was in the van down by the river, but he was crashing in the van and parking lots of some of the places he stopped. But one in particular made me laugh. Stop and shop. Oh yeah, which is of course where CK worked. Hell Not yeah. that stop and shop, but, but a that was the the grocery store chain where CK worked. He never said that on the right. show. I always assumed it, but also because that's where I shopped when I lived in Yeah, Jack I mean, as a it's kid. very popular. Anybody listening that's not from the East Coast, it's pretty similar to like a Jewel Osco yeah. or Kroger, Kroger or something yeah. like that. But if you guys are from out there by Connecticut, you know exactly what we're talking about. You do, you do. <laughs> so, yeah, that's where CK worked. It's several different ones, but uh, uh, the last one he worked for, Mount Kisco, New York. So he moved around between Connecticut and New York. I remember when I was growing up, the fucking... Uh, the stop and shop we would go to was right next door to a Caldor. Remember that? Oh store? yeah, Caldor. Yeah, and that it's like was Walmart, a, right? And so that was like yeah, pre Walmart basically. Yeah, Bradley's. And, and so I used to Caldor. love to go there and shit. And then fucking now they're both gone. But yeah, yeah, I always think of them. Yep, that's for sure. Yeah, that's funny about Caldor because yeah, I know about that. <laughs> um, so Howell will tell his biographer that he didn't live in the van because he wanted to. Or that he just did it because he wanted to do it. Yeah, he, he didn't have to. He, he didn't have to at all. Yeah, he just thought, why spend money on rent? Fuck yeah. I, got I could spend it on these it. prostitutes. And so he preferred just living in his van and having the spending money. And- I mean, I'm fucking down Dude. with all that. My only thing is you ain't got no fucking like bathroom shower Right, he would go to like the the, the YMCA, YMCA yeah. and yeah. shit. Yeah, I mean, you can go to truck side. I get it. Like you can do that shit, but yeah. man, after a while, I'd be like, "Fuck." That'd be yeah, rough. Yeah, I'd just love to. It'd take be a shower. rough, especially Connecticut, man. I mean, we're not talking about Florida or right. something. It's yeah, it's a little fucking You can't just fucking have diarrhea too. and go walk outside in the street and shit all over in Connecticut, <laughs> right, right? Like you can in Florida. Yeah. <laughs> if you see pictures of this fucking van, dude, god damn, it's rough, man. <laughs> it's fucking, it's fucking wow. disgusting. Yeah. So he also said he would, 
it, that uh, having an apartment would be like an anchor holding him down. And if he got laid off, he could just drive somewhere else and go to work. So yeah, because he's landscaping and shit. So yeah. So Chris, it gets a little chilly in Connecticut, kind of similar to what it's like here. I can't imagine living in a van and those kind of, <laughs> se- you know. Dude, it'd be like fucking Boston or fucking. Who'd we just do the murder mac? Fucking, yeah, the toolbox. Uh, yeah, toolbox. Fucking, I couldn't remember their fucking name, but they're in California. Right. I could see if they fucking were chilling in the van. Right. All the time. And the like, murder mac was pretty sweet. Right. It was and a newer he, van, but this he's is doing like this as it's getting a cold and shit. Man. He's doing this as it's getting cold and shit in Connecticut. So like, right. you either got to have that running, some <laughs> kind of fucking heat going on or with those prostitutes fucking warming them up up, dude i don't know body heat dude that's why he (laughs) did yes and you know he had the landscaping tools and the supplies in there i mean it's just really disgusting two of the side windows were just plywood right even glass there it was like it just looks like begging to be pulled over begging to be pulled over it and looking like if you're prostitute fucking you're looking at that thing like i am not getting in that because that looks like a fucking murder machine it does it does joey here we go again with the rape van um he's got the back decked out with a sort of work table (laughs) that he's using as a bed i mean what is it with these guys the murder mac murder mobile i mean it's like a mobile fucking rape center i mean what else do you fucking need if that's what you're fucking into i mean it's perfect uh, right. william bonin like he'd fucking you know use the van too right like, if if you could get chicago people, ripper crew yeah right. if you could get people to get into that van or if you can or if you're good enough to duck people and get them in that van yeah you can go all over the place with them and fucking do whatever the hell you want with them I can't, man. Can you think like if they ran the fucking the luminescent light over his van with oh all the cobblestone on the one <laughs> stage in the back of that and van. fucking and, and this is what's crazy too is like you're talking about murder mac and shit. We're talking about like toolbox killers. That was back in the day. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, and this, yeah. This case isn't that fucking. No, old. it's fairly so, modern, right? So this is pretty modern. So now, speaking of which, like it's cold, like he's you know in those areas, and you got to fucking run your van. Gas is crazy expensive. Like back in Murder Mac days, the toolbox killers, right. you could have five bucks and probably run your fucking car all night long. Right? right. You know what I'm saying? True. Now True. it's like you're spending eighty bucks for this van. Right. Are you really going out just all the time? Like, yeah, I well, don't know. Yeah, you know, maybe you said maybe it's just. Pulling Pulls the fucking hooker over over on top of it. Yeah, I mean, he did sleep. They don't. Even, a lot of them ain't got a lot of meat on them. Right, that's true. So, like Chris said, he's showering at the YMCA. He's crashing in the parking lot of the Stop and Shop. He has a few girlfriends, which is amazing. Uh, before he settles in with Dory, um, and uh, he's still though frequenting the prostitute. So that never stops. I mean, it's a, his addiction, dude. It is, man. Uh, she believed in him, unfortunately, and supported his fucked up decisions and even visited him in prison when he went the first time. Uh, he just could not keep his ass out of trouble. He started out raping his victims, but eventually would kill them to avoid getting caught. And he thought once he killed, it was game on. Oh, yeah, and yeah, he you, knew that he had nothing to lose yeah, you kill one because he's already get, got a death sentence. Yeah, so why not? Keep going. Get as many as I can. Yeah. So fuck it. So the first victim that was found. Okay. So there were some victims prior to this, but this is the one that got that him got in him. fucking trouble. Yeah. Nilsa Arismendi. Uh, she, he knew her and her boyfriend. Her boyfriend was a real fucking winner, Ace Sanchez. Oh, I mean, like she was out there hooking to get heroin for both of them. Right. So. He's not working, and she's out there fucking prostituting working. herself, which is fucked up. And he would always see them walking hand in hand down the highway together to try to score some crack. Um, they had tried to kick the habit, and she was, you know, like we said, selling herself. For the uh, for the drugs, but I don't know how a fucking guy could do that. I mean, that's just fucked you up. You ever seen Requiem for a Dream? <laughs> <laughs> that's just nasty, man. Um, but I guess the need for drugs was all that they cared about. That's so. legit. Yeah. Like, it is. Yeah. So originally, Ace was a suspect, but eventually was cleared and passed the polygraph. So Now, Chris, he was living with Nilsa... 
uh, or he was giving Nilsa a ride to score some drugs. And apparently uh, he would get fucked up with them. And she promised them a little blowjob and some cash. For a ride. Hell yeah, yeah, that's dude. fucking pretty good deal. Uh, that is good. Dude, <laughs> like I said, ask ass grass. <laughs> <laughs> so, but it goes a little south, Chris. They get in a little argument. Yeah, he kind of beats her with a fucking wrench. And like, right, like, side of the head. Like, uh, strangles her and kills her and... Nobody, he raped the shit out of her too, right? I believe yeah. he did, yeah. Like like a fucking douchebag. Now, like I said, that was the first one that got found, not first one murdered. I wonder yeah. if that's fucking, so, remember that, that house that Jack built? Yeah. With Matt Dillon? Yeah. And fucking, that's like the first scenes with Uma Thurman, and he's in there fucking in his the, murder van. And he fucking just, smacks her with the fucking tire iron. Dude, wow. yo. Yeah, this is a big wrench, man. He hit yeah. this girl on the side of the head and then strangles her, like Chris said. Joey, he is fucked up um, this time because their boyfriend, Ace, saw him get in that van. Ace is, was, he was in the place. Ace was Ace in the is place. The place. <laughs> um, he sees his girlfriend get in Howell's van, so that winds up fucking him up. Yeah, I mean, he fucking knows exactly where to fucking go to tell them, you know, the last place he saw her. Right. Uh, Who he Describes with. this van, like yeah. Chris said, and it's boards a- in the fucking window. <laughs> I mean, not Very, that you know the van. You've, you've seen, seen it driving around. around. You too, know what the van fucking I'm places, about. right? Yeah. Officer, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Come on now. That van that just stinks. Just <laughs> looking at it makes you fucking think it stank. Right. Yeah. Bloodstains in the back of the van link him to Nilsa. So he gets arrested in North Carolina. They bring him back to Connecticut in 2004. The cops use DNA from Nilsa's relatives to prove that blood was hers. Uh, and there was blood from at least one other victim. So the cops know that she wasn't right. the only one. But I think they it's also. It's crazy, like when they went to go pick, because he was hiding, kind of hiding out in North Carolina. Right. When they actually came to arrest him, they re- they were doing it for like uh, steal. They said they they said told him they were picking him up for uh, stealing uh, like lawn care equipment or some shit. Oh, okay. And it wasn't even very much. And like, because I was listening to the interview with uh, Ann, uh, Howard, and Howard, and Howard, yeah. Yes. And uh, eventually, she said that he was said eventually in the middle of the trip, he's like, "So why are you coming?" 800 miles to pick me up on this fucking misdemeanor oh, and they're wow. like oh by the way <laughs> held up a picture of nilsa and they she said like his blood just drained from it, it just went white instantly oh wow like, and that was in the car on getting extradited from fucking south north carolina to fucking wow. connecticut so that's a long ride right there once they show yeah. you that it's like fuck yeah a lot <laughs> of shit running through your mind how the fuck am i gonna get out of this one they also found six videotapes of him having rough sex with women, but the angle of the camera does not allow them to be able to identify anybody. It was anybody. just his balls in their cut. <laughs> yeah, I was like, what the fuck? <laughs> the classic ball. Angle. Right. <laughs> uh, he would drive around with the women tied up in his van, stop for a while, rape them, and then drive around some more. That's why he had the van. It's as easy as that. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, you can't do that in an apartment. No. While the police build this case against them, they're looking for the body, and Howell is at the Cheshire Correctional Institution in Connecticut. So he doesn't admit to killing her, so they're kind of in a pickle. They don't have the body, but they know her blood was in his van, and so they're trying to put it together. But then, of course, he wants to go to jail and start fucking talking about shit. Here we fucking go again. He's got a celly, Jonathan Mills, (laughs) who finds out some shit about Howell, who tells him they're playing cards. He tells him about Nilsa, tells him about other victims. He tells him that there's a monster living in him, the sick ripper, he calls himself. Sick ripper! <laughs> <laughs> the cards though are fucking unique, like a yeah. tactic, dude. Like, yeah, the cops make these playing cards with the missing women on the back or, or, or Jane missing Doe's people or whatever. Yeah, shit, shit like that. Too. And they give them to the inmates to use to play cards, hoping the motherfucker would be like, notice one of them. Hey, like, I know her. Hand. I did that. Yeah, that's one of my victims. Start boasting about like all right we got you yeah so he's in prison chris and they got these cards and nilsa's picture comes up and that's what prompts him to start telling 
uh, Jonathan Mills all about what happened. He tells him all the details. Um, he told him that he kept one victim in the murder mobile for two weeks because it was too yeah, the cold was to too bury hard. her. Like, oh my god! I guess I mean it's winter time, so I guess if he's warm, the van's gonna keep the body froze. But <laughs> that is fucking disgusting, <laughs> though. Fucking... Two weeks in a van to stink. And the fact that fucking van never gets pulled over is beyond me. I know. Especially in Connecticut. I mean, (laughs) like they're pretty strict about stuff, you know. Right? Look at this van. It's just beat the fucking shit, dude. Right. Right. I mean, I guess if he's following all his lights work and he's following the fucking laws driving, fuck. I guess. Um, He slept as a victim like she was his baby, he called it. That's what I was thinking, like, fucking, if that van, you know, you got a victim in there for two fucking weeks, like, that shit smells. Oh, yeah. But yeah. can you imagine, like, Dahmer's apartment, like, you know, you've seen the pictures of how small right, it was dude. and shit. Uh, and he had all them body parts, like, Jesus Christ, that foul, had to have been man. so fucking horrible. Yeah, I couldn't even imagine it. So, he's talking about this. The pictures of the van show it, as you said, Chris, absolutely filthy and disgusting. Jonathan Mills, of course, goes to the cops with the information to try to get a reduced sentence. He knows so much detail that he could draw a map of the area (laughs) that he had never been to and tell them where each victim was buried. So pretty fucking detail. How do they know he's never been there? How should it just been like, how the fuck? How? What he knows where everything's at. I don't know that shit's there. Right. If I could pin it on Mills, dude. <laughs> <laughs> so Howell told Mills that he was gonna dream about the women in his garden that night, so that's just fucked. Now, Chris, we covered this one, uh, or covered one of these type of stories with the Manson family just here last week. Talking to the cellmate, Susan never a Atkins, good idea. Dumbass Sadie bitch. <laughs> Dumb yeah, man. I mean, just never a good idea, man. Uh, I think with the, it's a different scenario with Howell and fucking Atkins because Atkins just like didn't think anything was going to happen. I think Howell was just like, fuck it. I'm going to talk about this shit. Yeah. It feels nice. He's reliving it in his head. Yeah. And he's just like, fuck yeah, that feels good being able to remember that right i know from being in jail too some people just fucking feel like because they're in a criminal setting they can just talk about about whatever yeah yeah. people are gonna be cool with it because man i you know i went to prison i heard some people just talking about some crazy shit like it's just like dude i probably could do the same thing like oh man i'm gonna go fucking turn this in because what the fuck right right Right. man don't we know prison snitch no hell no (laughs) Now, Joey, the cops don't have a body, and they have concerns about proving their case with this jailhouse snitch. You know, don't doesn't necessarily bear a lot of weight sometimes in a courtroom, and a prostitute who could be missing and not dead. So they had a lot of concerns here. So what does Howell end up doing? We've heard this term before. Yeah, he takes the Alfred plea. Uh, talked about in the West Memphis case, and yeah. It, I've actually seen it pop up in quite a few more cases. Like it's where somebody basically they, the state can't convict you because they don't have like full evidence. So, right. But you're basically fucked. So you take the Alfred plea, you're admitting that the crime occurred, but you're not taking uh, responsibility for it. Right. The state gets the fucking close the case on the deal. Right. And you get a fucking slap on the wrist, basically. Right. Or in the West or Memphis 3, they walk. exonerated, right? right. Um, in this case, not that, but... <laughs> yeah. But, but he does take the Alfred plea, and, you know, he fucking... He doesn't... He was fucking so remorseless... He was like Gary Ridgway also in the the fact that he's like, these missing hookers are fucking trash anyway. Right. Nobody's missing them. I kind of right. did. He, like, he didn't say it in so many words, but he basically had that mentality, too, that he did a favor. Yes. You know? So for him to take the Alfred plea and fucking get it, he, that was as fucking light as he could have walked. Right. Yeah, because he only got 15 years. Yeah. And that was murder. Yeah. Uh, rape, you know, kidnapping and a bunch of shit. Um, he's but they, also, just didn't, they just didn't have the fucking the evidence. No, they had no body. They had some blood stains in the van. Right. And, you know, some eyewitnesses. But he but, knew her, so yeah. who knows that maybe they weren't hanging out in a van. And, it could have been more circumstantial. Right. right. 
Um, he was also charged with tampering with a witness when he threatened his cellmate and his family. Uh, <laughs> just weeks after the sentencing, a hunter stumbles upon some human bones in the woods behind the West Farm Shopping Mall in West Hartford, Connecticut. This is where Howell had been stashing his victims. And as so I crazy, said, right behind a shop, I know, a strip mall. <laughs> I know. Uh, Nilsa Arismendi was not the first one he killed, but the one who got him in prison initially. And he was picking up these prostitutes, tying them up, as we said, raping them for 12 hours, sleeping little cat naps in between, kind of fucked up. And then the following morning, it was kind of a ritual. He said he would buy him breakfast Which at McDonald's. Fucking crazy. While they're tied up in the back with duct tape over their mouth, ordering a McDonald's for breakfast, feed him, and then kill him. So that was his thing. Um, and he said he would turn the music up loud, so just in case they tried to scream. How are you ordering McDonald's with the fucking music up? I don't know. I wondered man. about that. Loud you enough. The stereo cranked. Loud fucking... enough to where you could do what you got to do. I don't know. I'm sure the people at the drive-thru loved having him come there right. all oh, skanked dude. out in this stinky-ass fucking van. Yeah, could you imagine him taking the money at the drive-thru in a fucking rotting corpse in the back <laughs> of the... I mean, that's just fucking disgusting. How many people that worked there, but when he went through there, like... Right. Why did... How did we not know we could have fucking... Right. Like, for real. Exactly. Uh, But he would strangle the victims, wrap them in garbage bags, and push them down a steep embankment behind that shopping center into a ravine. And, Chris, it reminds me of Bubbles with the shopping carts. Shove them down in the fucking water. (laughs) Now they're nobodies. They're free. I could take them wherever I want. That's right. That's (laughs) right. Sounds rational. Sounds rational. Um, Or how he would go to the mall and throw them down the embankment into the woods. Yeah, yeah. And come and get them. Um, he would later go down to the ravine, drag the bodies about 100 yards to a 15-acre <laughs> lot that was off limits to hunting. So he thought he had a good spot picked out and thinking nobody's going to find him. He keeps a, sh- a shovel hidden in the area so he can do what he's got to do. But this area is very swampy, so as he's digging, water he's getting water. High, yeah. So he only buries him a couple feet deep, and this is, again, what he would call his garden where seven of his victims were buried in shallow graves. It was a tough place to access. There was no trespassing signs all over the place. So if he could have dug deeper graves, he might not have ever been caught. Well, I mean, technically, the the, the hunters that were back there shouldn't even have been, have right. been in that area anyway, exactly. honestly. No. So it like, was if just they weren't accident. breaking the law, they fucking never would have found... That the bones exactly. exactly. You're right though, man. Those fucking I I remember from fucking living out there. Them like swamp area. Like you don't think of swamps when you think of New England shit, but they're out there. Right. And fucking I remember the ones like around my house in Connecticut. Like man, you fucking stuck out there. Right. Like, it's fucking hard moving, and to think fucking burying a body at all out there. Right. That had to have been. They were shallow, like they said, because you couldn't have done much. But the thing is, in a place like around Hartford where he's at, your other option, most of the ground in that area is fucking uh, stone. So you're not going to be digging much anyway. Right. Almost any home, if you put a equipment. fucking put an in-ground pool or anything out there in Connecticut, I remember motherfuckers always, every time in the neighborhood, put a pool or when we did it, you'd have to fucking get the jackhammer and blast out so much fucking rock. And, right. You know, out here, we got a lot luckier and shit. Right, That's a lot true. of dirt. That's true. Now, Chris, one of his victims was Janice Roberts, who is actually a transgender woman. Now, when I see pictures of this dude, it looks like a dude in drag. I don't know how the fuck he didn't realize that's what it was. He must have been stupid wasted. He might have been (laughs) stoked, really. Right? Well, That's what I'm wondering, because he claims he didn't know. He says he pulled pulled the the wig wig off, off. and that's when he realized that it was a dude, not a female. Got pissed the fuck off. Right. Just choked him out right there at that moment. Like, no, you fucked. You got me fucked up, dude. Like, you tricked me. Fuck you. Yeah, that's fucked up. Yeah, he was not happy about that. No. At least that's what he's claiming. That's what he's claiming. Now, Joey, Howell would tell the police that he would remove the victim's fingertips and jaw to avoid them from being identified. And sometimes he claimed he was taking some of these parts down to Virginia when he was visiting his family. So 
in some ways he's kind of smart, but in other ways he's dumb as fucking hell, man. Right, and I mean that's like, uh, like you said, this case isn't that old. It's not like the fucking killers we talk about. Some of the fucking retro ones, right? Oh my god, and taking off the fingertips and all that shit and the jaw—that's like what you see in movies now. So anybody that's going to start serial killing, like they're going to think that they're slick. If right. they not watch four DNA. episodes of Dexter, if they fucking take off the fucking figure. To, right. But you know, as, as they've gotten slicker, so have the police and the right. police have, I mean, them and forensic pathologists and stuff, they'll figure out who the people are. Right. There are some Jane and John Doe's of course, that people come across, but it's very, very rare because there's so many fucking uh, stamps on people with fucking blood tests or fucking DNA. dental work and DNA. And right. There's just way too many now. Right, right. So now the cops really dig up the area and find the skeletal remains of the seven victims and charge William Devin Howell for the other six since he was already sentenced for the murder of Nilsa. So They're like, ah, years. you didn't think we were going to find them, did you? That's right, that's right. <laughs> you talk the, too much. <laughs> the victims' ages range from 23 to 55. Uh, there was some drama with the police lab taking for fucking ever. It took them until 2014 when they were finally able to give these families some closure and identify the victims. Uh, Howell pleads guilty, claiming he didn't want to put the families through a trial. He was weeping and very apologetic when he made a statement to the victims' families. And the judge sentences him to six consecutive life sentences or 360 years. Because in Connecticut, I think the max you could get is 60 years. Right. So, so that's how they do it. 360 uh, makes sense with the six consecutive. Yeah, they don't have death penalty. Right. Um, he wanted the death penalty, but Connecticut hasn't had that since 2015. So I'm not really sure because his crimes happened before that. But nonetheless, he did not qualify for the death penalty, which that, in this that's, case. That's ex post facto. If your fucking crimes occurred before a law was changed or whatever, then you can't get tried under that. Right. Yeah. So attorney and true crime author Ann Howard contacted Howell when he was in prison for the murder uh, for the one murder, and then he's interviewed by her. She writes back and forth, visited him regularly, uh, telling him she wanted to write this book. Uh, he agrees, but he suggests the title Dancing with the Devil. <laughs> of course but she did. She chooses Dancing his with the garden. Devil with the pale moonlight. Um, I kind of like Dancing with the Devil. She's better. like, look, Sick Ripper's tight, but... This is going to be his garden. That's right. That's right. <laughs> so she puts parts of the letters she writes back and forth with him in the book. It's very good. I got the book. I did listen uh, to a whole interview with her. That was pretty badass. Yeah, she's obviously the go-to person with this case because she's an attorney, but she's really into the true crime thing, too. Um, she's from that area, too, Joey. She's in uh, in that general vicinity right. there in Connecticut. Um, so he talks about killing the women was a way of kind of putting them out of their misery. So pretty fucked up. Because they weren't good. Right. right. Because they were fucking worthless. Uh, so. He's currently still at that Cheshire Correctional Institute, which is near New Haven. He's 51. And he told Ann Howard he wakes up every day and is miserable. So good. I think he should. Fuck yeah, that said, guy, man. He said, I may be alive living but this isn't a life or some shit yeah she, she said to him those other people don't have a life you do and he's like i may have a life but this isn't living it was like dude yeah you yourself. fucked up man you know, like a lot better than being in the swamp right behind right. the grocery store that's yeah. right being in the garden man. yeah so uh chris joey anything to add to old william devon howell no no, I I'm think good, we did man. pretty well. Yeah, I think so, too. Um, I did my research for this one by watching that really good documentary on YouTube from Top Box TV. I watched that. Which, yeah, had the interviews with Ann Howard, which was really good. I got the book, His Garden, that she wrote. It is really good. There's not a ton of stuff on this guy, even though it's a case within the last 20 years. But there are some things out there. You can watch some of the courtroom stuff on YouTube, um, like uh, impact statements and stuff like that. Yeah, I just I listened to a whole uh, like one hour interview with just her talking about it and shit. Oh, cool, it's pretty sweet. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of good stuff out there, but 
not as many as obviously the big name ones. So, all right, next week we're going to be doing a bonus episode for you guys. I've been uh, got a little scheduling conflict, so we're going to try to come in here on Thursday, but we don't know what the weather's going to be like, so we may wind up doing it Tuesday anyway. But, Joey, what was the topic? You picked this one, man. Yeah, fucking <clears throat> Rhode Island 2003. Great White played a fucking show at a club and uh, yep. pyrotechnics problems. And no, the place wasn't went a up in That was a huge problem. Yeah, and over 100 people died. Yeah, so uh, the station nightclub fire. It's a very, very fascinating story. Yeah, it's going to be awesome. Yeah, I'm really excited about it because at first I was like, yeah, that's cool. You know, obviously I knew about it. Right. But I didn't know about it. It until i really started digging right. in and learning a lot more and that's like that's one of my favorite things about doing this podcast is the amount of things i've learned from doing the research it's it's really cool um so that's what we're doing next week and so that should be good joey what about page a day oh yeah i got some page a day all right uh fucking especially you know since whenever we fucking skip a week as we did the fucking uh the rewind right anyway so i'll get right into it thank you page day got some badass shit this is fucking sponsored by the sick ripper <laughs> <laughs> this gonna be my thing all week <laughs> all right so uh no there was some good ones though so there's this lady named betty broderick oh yeah oh do you know this case pete I've heard of it. yeah yeah this is a good one this is a fucking crazy one really so She's with this dude, Dan, and she supports him and their four children as he goes through, uh, you know, MD and JD degrees uh, in, in medical field. So he eventually becomes a successful malpractice lawyer in La Jolla, California. And uh, Betty Broderick, she continues to work part time and raise their kids. So it's not like an ideal marriage. Like she was always complaining that she felt you know, like she was a single parent because he was always at fucking always work. Gone. Right, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Right. Uh, he worked, uh, you know, long hours. And then he hires this 21-year-old named Linda Kolkina as his uh, legal assistant in 1982. So almost right off the bat, she's fucking, Betty's accusing him of having an affair with her. Um, the arguments escalate. Broderick tells her, you know, uh, or Dan denied it. And he tells her that she's crazy. Um Broderick, he's suspicious of the relationship, you know, between Dan and Linda. She even burned some of his suits when she learned that he spent his 38th birthday with her. I mean, that is pretty fucked up if you fucking right. spend your birthday with your fucking, you know, your assistant. Um, in 1985, he moves out and files a restraining order against Betty. Uh, she dumps their four children on Dan's doorstep one at a time. But, oh, you know, wow. to her surprise, he just takes full custody of like, them right, cool, each time. Yeah. Uh, their divorce, Broderick versus Broderick, was legendary. Uh, fucking. So his response, or I'm sorry, her response to the divorce it was very violent and disturbing. Uh, she left hundreds of profane messages on his answer machine, showed up to his house, which he shared with Linda, of course, who he's with now, right. um, on numerous occasions, despite multiple restraining orders that were put against her. Uh, she smeared Boston cream pie on his suits. Uh, she spray, <laughs> she spray painted his walls. She broke his windows. She would demand the children that, uh, she would tell them how to treat Dan and Linda. Like, this is like, how this you, is better, how you yeah, treat exactly. them. Yeah. Uh, she even drove her car through the front door of Dan's house. God damn, dude. <laughs> uh, after, <laughs> one, after one hearing for violating a restraining order, she spent three days in jail. I mean, I've gotten to this point in this story. This bitch has done all this crazy shit, and she's right. done three days. She drove her car through his fucking right. front door. Three and she's days. had restraining orders, you know what I'm saying? Wow. Uh, so by some accounts, they say that Dan kind of egged her on with her behavior and instead of showing sympathy and encouraging to get help, he would just kind of like fuck with her. You know what I'm saying? Right. Um, he was president of the local bar association, of course, you know? Right. God damn. And so she couldn't even get a fucking lawyer who would work with her for the divorce. Oh my God. (laughs) So he exploited legal loopholes to drag the proceedings out for five years. Uh, and her behavior just got increasingly more crazy i could see that though yeah Yeah, i mean come on so their divorce is finalized on january 30th 1989 and dan he's a multi-millionaire 
he pays her $30,000 plus alimony. So a few months later, just 10 days after what would have been the Broderick's 20th anniversary, Dan ends up marrying Linda. So now they're husband and wife. Okay. And she was so concerned about Dan's safety that at their wedding, she asked him to wear a bulletproof vest. God oh damn, dude. God. Uh, so a month before they got married, Betty Broderick, she had bought a gun claiming that now as a single woman, she needs protection. Protection, yeah. Right. So she takes shooting lessons and begins to threaten Dan with the gun. Of course. Uh, on November 5th, 1989, she made good on her threat. She drove to Dan and Linda's house in the middle of the night, letting herself in with a key she stole from her daughter. Uh, Broderick shot both Dan and Linda as they slept. Uh, Linda was killed instantly, but Betty said that Dan had said, okay, you shot me. I'm dead before he died. Um, she immediately turned herself into police. She never denied shooting them, but she insisted that it wasn't premeditated. She claimed that she was startled because Linda began, began screaming when she entered the room, even though all the evidence showed that yeah, Linda she's... shot in the head and the chest and she was never in awake bed, for any yeah. of it. Wow. Uh, so at Broderick's first trial, her attorney, uh, Jack Early, he, you know, was using the battered uh, woman syndrome defense, um, saying that she had been pushed over after years of psychological, emotional, and mental abuse at the hands of Dan. And he emphasized how she'd worked five jobs while he was in law school, which she did, you know. Right. Um, and that he had repaid her with lies, infidelity, and legal bullying. The prosecution said that Betty Broderick was a narcissist who had been planning both their murders for months uh and they even called in their oldest daughter as a witness to testify that her mother was angry and unrepentant about it wow. so the trial ends in a mistrial after two jurors are held out for the manslaughter conviction one of whom said i only wonder what took her so long that's what the oh, oh my god, god dude. <laughs> <laughs> why did it take her so long dude yeah. fuck that dude so, so <laughs> that the second trial goes on it's almost the exact same thing same defense everything else uh the jury finds her guilty on two counts of second degree murder so she sends to 15 years to life uh in 2010, two of her children testified to the parole board imploring them to release her. Two of her children testified saying that the they should way. keep her in. Oh, wow. Yeah, so that would be fucked up. You know, yeah. so, uh, Her parole was turned down because she showed no remorse, and she still refused to admit any responsibility for it. So she's been denied yeah, two, uh, parole two stay. more times, wow. and she's not eligible till 2032. So Betty Broderick, Damn. fucking crazy bitch. Right. All right, uh, I got one about, um, I actually brought this one up kind of a while back, the Long Island Railway shooting. And this was 1993 on December 7th. Uh, so there's a train that's pulling into Marillan Avenue Station, and one of the passengers, Colin Ferguson, he begins just firing at fucking other passengers with a semi-automatic weapon. He ends up killing six, he injures 19. What year? Uh, uh, 1993. So these other passengers, they end up tackling him. They held him down, and that's how they subdued him. Like those people fucking saved like a lot they of were other fucking people's heroes lives. for real. Uh, and who Colin Ferguson was is he was a mentally ill man from Jamaica who had lived on the West Coast before he had moved to New York in 1993. I think he lived there for like ten months or something like that. Wow. Uh, when the train rolled in, he just became. He started walking down the aisle and shooting motherfuckers at random, like no fucking rhyme or reason to it. Uh, his original attorney tried to use the black rage as a defense, okay. uh, but even Ferguson thought that was fucking stupid and fired him. Really? And so what's fire? What's Ferguson do? Acts as his own fucking attorney as Chris. Oh, Chris loves that. Oh yeah. Oh man. Uh, his defense. Oh, a good move. His defense was that a white man stole his gun and did the shooting. He later the changed his story and said that it was a guy that did look like him, but that it was somebody else that did it. Uh, so on February 17th, 1995, oh, that's my birthday. Yeah. Oh yeah, it is. <laughs> but he got six life terms and six counts of, uh, murder and 22 attempted. So wow. fucking yeah. Colin yeah, that's Ferguson, fucking crazy, yeah, the man. Long Island railway shooting. That's brutal. Um, a few more here. Uh, oh yeah. Okay. Okay. I got two more. This one's pretty funny. I'm going to read it first. <laughs> 
It's not really funny at all. I don't know why. I just laugh at fucking dark shit, I guess. I do, too. <laughs> okay. I do, too. So, uh, on January 2015, there's these body parts that start washing ashore at Coney Island Creek in Brooklyn, New York. So, there's a hand, then there's a foot, and then a month later, part of a leg with strange discoloration. So, as the skin rots, it turns black, purple, green, right, blue. Right. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. But this skin on this piece had some red to it, so they were guessing that it was a tattoo. So, they bring it to the chief medical examiner to test the theory. Lab workers soaked the skin in lotion, carefully stretched it closer to its original shape, which I thought that was pretty fucking yeah. cool. Yeah. It puts the lotion than, on the skin. Pretty, <laughs> I mean, that yeah. makes sense. But it does right. make sense, but I thought that was right. pretty fucking yeah, cool. Yeah, it is fucked up. Uh, so whenever they did that, they were able to see that the blurry fucking image was Sounds a rose familiar. next to a heart with the name Monique written inside it. Uh, the detectives consulted with tattoo artists about the findings to get a profile. Right. They determined the tattoo was of poor quality and pre-drawn, either off the flash wall of a tattoo shop or by a quote-unquote kitchen wizard, <laughs> <laughs> an artist who does house calls. Oh, wow. It was likely inked in the 70s or 80s because uh, the name was probably the victim's own, and which that was common at that time right, for that right. to, to do that. So the mystery of the tattoo was solved, but the case itself is cold. They never figured That's out who fucking it was. Cr- they fucking covered these artists for fucking information about a body and they're like oh we're just we're gonna break this tattoo down for you man. <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> fuck yeah. all right so the last one i got and this one i thought was really fucking good too uh, again thanks page a day fucking going into the second year of reading this yeah. shit uh but this one's about uh nurse Kristen gilbert so before she was a serial killer, Kristen Gilbert was known for using death to manipulate people and garner attention. We've seen this in fucking other cases. Right. Uh, she'd been faking suicide attempts, making violent threats against others, and everything since she was a teenager. In 84, she studied nursing at Bridgewater College. She left her boyfriend a suicide note claiming to have eaten glass, which she didn't do. Uh, so college officials ordered her to undergo psychiatric treatment, and she eventually leaves school. Four years later, she completes her nursing degree at Greenfield Community College and marries Glenn Gilbert, and then they start a family. Uh, in 1989, uh, she begins working at the VA Medical Center in Northampton, Massachusetts. So Better watch out the, for them VA yeah, nurses, watch Jake. Out for yeah, them. right? <laughs> uh, she was popular among her colleagues and was featured in a magazine VA Practitioner for her excellent nursing work. In 1995, she started an affair with James Peralt, who was a VA hospital police officer who worked the same shifts as her most of the time. Right. Um, now, it was around this time that her colleagues started noticing an unusually high amount of deaths occurring during her shifts. Oh. They jokingly nicknamed her the Angel of Death. Nice. Uh, but no one suspected foul play came from it. Uh, the disproportionate death rate went unnoticed until 1996 when three nurses finally spoke up. Uh, they voiced their concerns uh, about the increase in cardiac arrest deaths on her watch and noted that the hospital's supply of epinephrine which is a stimulant that can cause heart attacks if you give it to them in large doses, was strangely low. So, oh. you know, process of elimination. Uh, when the angel of death heard that she'd been implicated, she panicked and called in a bomb threat to the hospital, <laughs> which was a misguided <laughs> attempt to delay the ensuing investigation. Oh, my God. Uh, her colleagues at the VA estimated that she killed at least 350 people and was responsible for another 300 medical emergencies. God damn. Wow. Because hospital police were required to be present at all medical emergencies, they believed that her motive for these crimes was to get the attention of Officer Peralt, who she ended up having the affair with, right. and to be able to spend more time with him during work hours. Oh, wow. That's fucking crazy really? shit. Uh, they also noticed or noted that Gilbert got a thrill from inducing high-risk medical emergencies. Like, she liked to be in that situation right, right. and part wow. of that, so she would fucking create them. The list of emergencies she caused was unfathomable. It included removing a patient's breathing tube, abandoning a... Abandoning a, a 
I can't. Abandoning? It's that fucking honey. Uh, (laughs) Abandoning a patient during a cardiac arrest, refusing to use a defibrillator on a dying patient, and forcing an inexperienced staff member to use it instead. Like, that's some of the shit she was on. God damn, dude. Jesus. So, in 96, when the allegations were made public, uh, you know, against Gilbert, she quit the VA hospital. Her Her lover, Officer Peralt, he ended their affair when he learned of her actions and agreed to cooperate with the authorities he was like fuck that crazy bitch like oh, wow. I, I uh, hope so dude Jesus. so she's fucking pissed by his betrayal and, and she starts harassing him uh she checked herself into seven different psychiatric hospitals in that fall oh, after that uh staying from one to ten days during each visit in january 98 gilbert was put on trial for the bomb threat that she called in she was found guilty and sentenced to 15 months in prison. Later that year, her husband, Glenn, divorced her. He was granted custody of their two sons. Uh, in 1999, she was indicted in a federal court on three counts of first-degree murder and two counts of second-degree and an attempted murder. Uh, the death penalty is illegal in fucking Massachusetts in 84, but this was taken over by a federal court, so it's it was still upheld. Capital punishment was pursued. Um, she didn't get death row. Of course, the fucking, uh, her prison sentence was commuted, but she got life in prison plus 20 years with the possible, without the possibility of parole. So yeah, fucking damn crazy ass Brutal. bitch fucking killing people in the VA. Watch out. Jeez, God, I will watch out. Hopefully no, nobody transferred to Bloomington. You're right. <laughs> so yeah, that was page a day. A little long, but like I said, that yeah, was like love page two weeks day. worth of that. That's so. right. That's right. All right, well, we have done our fair share of murdering tonight. I think it's about time to crank up some metal and talk about it. So, Joey, what the fuck do we need to do? Skin Ripper! <laughs> Let's get our metal out! Because CK has passed on. He's not done educating the masses. CK will forever be the great metal motherfucker. We're here to stomp poser ass and eradicate the planet of their kind. CK has passed the torch to us, and we will forge the fuck on. In CK's name, we will bestow metal knowledge upon all of you. You know CK's listening to this and going, you fucking you fools. fucking morons. <laughs> I love the honey you. oil over there, yeah. Joey, on the pizza ale. Mm-hmm. Right? He'd be like... I get it. I understand. <laughs> <laughs> Talking about some fucking sick ripper shit going on. And we are now in the metal segment. And of course, the great metal motherfucker are always here with us. And Joey, we well, got the horns tonight and yeah. you picked another Illinois band. I did. Like, yeah, you did. Give me one sec. <laughs> Joey's over here like he's gotta, doing a pop tart and the pizza ale with, with the, the honey oil oil. on it. Yeah. Oh, yeah, it's chocolate covered cherry weed tarts, <laughs> and they're so good, so good. All right. <laughs> Thanks again to our listener that fucking supplied the honey. Yes. Just so you know, when you're listening, we took the whole thousand gram <laughs> bottle. Yeah, and me and Chris just polished split it, it off. Yeah, we just split it right in half. Bro. Oh yeah. <laughs> So I'm sure I'll be fucking feeling it until tomorrow. All right. So we're here in metal. Yeah. I'm doing fucking Waco Jesus. Oh, yeah, dude. Uh, The listeners that follow us on the fucking social media and shit, they probably already fucking know this and we're waiting on this because fucking we've been talking about it a little bit. Uh, The Patreon members already heard the fucking interview. Like, pretty fucking sweet. Uh, For those of you that aren't Patreon members that listen to this episode... And want to hear the interview with Kevin. We'll talk about it later, but that's going to come out tomorrow. It'll be tomorrow for y'all. Right. Anyhow. So I'm doing Waco Jesus. Yes. Uh, yeah, I've done fucking all Illinois bands so far. So, yeah, so far. I, I will it. deviate from that, but for now, we're going to keep it rocking. Oh, yeah, dude. Waco Jesus. And then, you know, they're basically from right here in our fucking backyard, central like Illinois. Legit. So they they formed in 1995 as Waco Jesus, but technically from 1993 until then, uh, they kind of went as Hot Stove, okay. which was the vocalist band, and then I the guitarist joined. Stove. And I don't want to give away a whole lot. Like I could give a little more information, but I don't want to give away stuff that's going to be in the interview too, so people can go fucking listen to that and hear some other shit. But anyway. 
So, right, Chris, like you said, hot stove. Like, we knew hot stove yeah, when we were growing up around too, here. Yeah. Right. Um, so they would fucking play shows around here. And then uh, in 1993, they fucking formed. And then in 95, they fucking changed the name to Waco Jesus. So... Uh, obviously, but it, for it's reasons. funny because yeah, he, for Koresh, right, I assume, obviously, yeah. I always check uh, Encyclopedia of Metallum for like certain facts, yeah. just so I can make I sure because yeah. they're a fucking great source. Um, pretty accurate too. They are. Uh, so one of the things that <laughs> I just caught my eye. Usually, I don't talk about, it, but on the Encyclopedia of Metallum, their lyrical themes for Waco Jesus are misogyny, hatred, lust, gore, sex, and feces. I was, <laughs> nice. I was like, all right, you guys win. <laughs> Perfect, you got it. <laughs> all the above. So, Waco Jesus is right now <laughs> Shane Bottens. Uh, Shane is the vocalist for the band. Uh, he's a.k.a. Joey B, in case anybody knows him as that. Right. Um Kevin Menson is the guitarist. Uh, he's the longest active member of the band. You know, uh, Shane started right after, but Kevin is basically the one that fucking started that. Uh, Chris Sweeborg, he's the bassist. And Justin DePinto, he's the fucking drummer. Um, and as a matter of fact, they fly him in from the East Coast to come out here and practice and play like all the time. Yeah, like that's how they got to do it. But he's a badass. And he was actually in uh, <clears throat> Malevolent Creation. He was in Pyrexia and he was in Mortal Decay before. So that's cool. Nice. Um, a couple uh, notable past members that, you know, for Waco Jesus is Bruce Duncan was the bassist for a while. And also, whenever uh, Waco first came out, Takashi Tanaka, he was the drummer, and he's a fucking badass, um, obviously, from overseas, but he was over here. It was just like, ironically, I don't know if he was going to school, I don't know the whole fucking story, but this badass metal drummer is just over here fucking in Central from Illinois, he's probably for school or something, right. and Kevin just fucking... However, they interacted and fucking oh, wow. met each other. And so fucking on the demo, like fucking Takashi Tanaka's on there. Um, and then also Johnny B played drums for them, who is fucking uh, Illinois wild man himself, like fucking known in the underground. And then Nick Knoll, he had played drums for them. He was in Hot Stove and Lividity for a while. And of course, he passed away in 2000, unfortunately. Yeah. But he was a drummer for a while. Um Waco has released uh, some pretty badass albums. Their demo came out in 1995 and was called The Destruction of Commercial Scum. <laughs> Fuck yeah. <laughs> and then in 1999, they released their first full length, which was called The Destruction of Commercial Scum. <laughs> which I was I'm like, why you got to confuse me, motherfucker? <laughs> so the demo and the first full length, you know, hey, that's how you do it, you know. But uh, then in 2003, they came out with their second full length. I fucking love this album, Filth. Uh, That's such a good fucking album, yep. dude. Nasty. Uh, Two thousand six, they did uh, "Receptive Receptive When Beaten." In two thousand nine, they did "Sex, Drugs, and Death Metal," which is also one of my favorites. And then two thousand thirteen was their last full length, and they did "The Mayhem Doctrine," which is fucking just killer album. Uh, listen to the interview you hear more but i'll also plug it now they're fucking i think about to go in the studio and start recording for their yeah. next full length awesome. which i'm super stoked on they fucking i've That's seen a cool. couple of their fucking songs i saw them at i'm gonna say it here on murder mill mayhem i saw it at chicago domination fest when i did the interview i fucked up and said cim which is a fest that ain't even been going on in years right because cdf ci it's like so easy to right. fuck that up but anyway, yeah, Chicago Domination Fest. I saw Waco play a couple of the new songs. They were just fucking badass. So they're going to go in the studio, record that. Fucking, you know, I also got to give a shout out. Kevin was cool enough. He wanted to put the demo back out a few years ago, and he came to me and let me do that on Fuck the Ass. On, yeah, on your label. Which he could have went to, like, any fucking bigger label and fucking did it and got way more than what I could have offered him, you know? But it was cool. He went through me, and I'm fucking, I thought it was cool. It got That's all over awesome. the place. Uh, 
I will say too, the Shane, you know, the vocals for Waco is basically the man behind Full Terror Soul. Yeah, that's so dude, fucking right. as people watch that fest fucking blow up and grow like yeah. all props go to him for that. Right. Uh but yeah, Waco Jesus man, fucking love that band. Fuck fucking yeah, love them dudes, did the interview, check that out. Fucking we'll yeah. jam a fucking, you know, minute of a track for you. Uh, yeah. That's awesome, man. Like I said, Low Twelve, we played a couple shows with them. I remember the bass player had to borrow my gear one night. I don't remember the circumstance, circumstance, but (laughs) hey, it happens. So very, very cool. All right. Well, we're going to go ahead and play a six minute clip of that interview you did, Joey, with Kevin. So listeners can check this out. Gormonger here, hanging out with Kevin Menson, the fucking guitarist for Illinois Extreme Metal Band Waco Jesus. Uh, How you doing, man? Doing great. How are you? Good, good. Hanging out here in Bloomington to fuck the ass studios, which is just my little ass living room. Doing this shit. Uh, thank you for coming out, fucking giving us a little fucking of your chat time. Appreciate that shit. Always a great time hanging out with you, especially at your place. Hell yeah. Alright, so uh, came up with some questions to ask the man right here. We're going to go through them. Fucking hope you guys dig this shit. So, Waco Jesus, uh, can you give us a rundown on when the band was formed and how that came about? Um, it essentially started in 93 uh, when I was a teenager and I assembled a group of guys together that basically had the worst personality traits and the worst <laughs> chemical addictions of anybody that I'd ever met. Pretty much so, perfect for death metal. Seemed like it. <laughs> so we were able to hold it together for... A few years and release a demo cassette that got some notoriety and uh, we played a we were supposed to play a festival here in Bloomington that the current singer Waco Jesus Shane put on years ago you were I think you were there Uh, it was probably Dying Fetus' CD release party for purification through violence I can't remember the name of the club but it was pretty close Lafayette wasn't it yeah Lafayette Club ballroom yeah and uh, basically, every member except for myself, Waco Jesus, either died or moved away. So Shane was in a band called Hot Stove, and with my band Waco Jesus falling apart, I joined Hot Stove as the second guitar player, and we played as Hot Stove for a couple of years and until Shane and I agreed that that was a really stupid name for a band. <laughs> and... Uh, so we pretty much kicked everybody else out of the band and started Waco Jesus back up again, and it's been Shane and I ever since. Hell yeah. What's some of your uh, biggest influences for whenever you were writing Waco Jesus? Uh, it's a weird thing, because you know, all of us grew up on Van Halen and Kiss and everything, and whether they want to admit it or not, we all started for the same reason, and it wasn't to become the greatest musicians on the planet it was pretty much to get laid and there eat go. better chicks and it worked so there's that but you know we all listened to Kiss and Van but I, I mean I can tell you the moment everything changed for me was watching Headbangers Ball and one night Testament's video for a Try by Fire came on oh yeah and just a bunch of dudes headbanging around a bonfire and I I was too young to know what it meant, but I realized if I didn't do that, then I was gay. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't want to be gay, so it was learned how to play fast. Hell yeah. And there it was. That's fucking awesome, man. Um, anyone that listens to Waco Jesus knows that it's heavily, you know, driven by sex, drugs, and death metal. Hence one of the names of the albums, I'm sure. Uh, was this intention from the beginning, or did it just play out that way as the band continued? Like, did you start right and just crude like death songs and shit like that or well stumbling into pornography at an early age probably (laughs) helped inspire some of that uh but most of it was you know going to shows for you as soon as i could when i was younger and seeing whenever you go to a table all you saw was you know gutted corpses and everything was this, this a lot of blood and a lot of you know carnage and everything and you know just personally i find the female form a lot more appealing than a graphic autopsy photo right you know so lyrically the band has moved on from some of that but you know bitches still be tripping so we're putting them on the album covers there you go fucking perfect 
Um, as you're drinking your beer right now, I know you love beer. I fucking you everywhere I go, you're fucking drinking something because you're an alcoholic. I'm not going to say that. Functioning I'm, alcoholic. But no, you're definitely a uh, connoisseur of sorts uh, for beers. So give me your five favorite beers, including your favorite overall. My favorite overall would be the Stone's Totalitarian Russian Imperial Style. Holy shit. It's, yeah, it gets the job done for sure. <laughs> Goose Island makes a really good Kentucky bourbon stout. I think everybody likes Dragon's Milk. Um, Atobiums makes a Belgian Grand Cru that if you drink a four pack, you'll be fucked. That stuff's awesome. And then, of course, Bud Select 55. When I'm watching the cards and shit, because yeah. I gotta, <laughs> gotta keep this beach body in shape, or I'll be relegated to dating chicks that look like wildebeests. Yeah. And I don't wanna do that, so sometimes you gotta low carb it. So, yeah, Bud Select 55. Now, if you're at a bar that's just fucking common as fuck. PBR. Okay, there you go. Fucking. I'm a dumpster. I'll pretty much drink anything. <laughs> I think I was drinking a, a liqueur made out of like ground up churros the yeah. other night. I don't give a fuck. <laughs> Uh, does the does the rest of the band share your fucking your exquisite taste of beers, or are they cool with grabbing a thirty pack of fucking whatever? And... Oh, everybody's good with drinking whatever, but everybody does like the good stuff as well. Nice. I don't know how Justin functions behind a drum set <laughs> on any occasion, really. But hell yeah, Joey, good job, Kevin, man. Always yeah. good talking good to Kevin. Job. Yep. Kevin Menson from Waco Jesus. The full interview, as Joey said will be released the day after this comes out as a bonus episode to hear the whole thing. And if you're a 666 Club member, you've already heard it, but hey, the rest of the world's going to check it out the day after this comes out. All right, Chris, what's your lost classic this week, man? It is kind of funny because I was like looking... I wanted something cool that I... I've, I was like, what haven't I heard in a while that I wanted to hear? Right. And I thought of this fucking uh, cassette that I had back when I was still in high school and shit. It's fucking from DeKalb, Chicago area, Sarcophagus. Hell yeah. Nice. They're fucking, yeah, yeah, yeah. They're fucking uh, 1994 demo. Fucking dead noise. No, not Sarcophagy, Sarcophagus. Right. But yeah, same thing. Not, but... Not, yeah. but same. Yeah. But, but yeah, dude, it's fucking badass. It, every song on it's heavy. There's only seven songs on it, but also... Death metal? Like, yeah, it's death metal as shit. But like, I remember like... I had I had the cassette and I had this stereo that the alarm would start the cassette playing. Oh, nice! So like, I had it set for the very first track to play, and it just starts off with dude just fucking screaming some shit. That's it. And I had it cranked <laughs> loud as shit. And my dad was in the kitchen making breakfast, and he dropped his plate as soon as my alarm went off, and it oh shattered all over. So I, I don't know. There's just something about that album that I'll always yeah. remember, dude. Fucking, That's fucking brutal. But yeah, fucking sarcophagus, dead noise is fucking awesome, man. Wow, very cool, man. That's cool. Yeah, digging up one that you hadn't heard in a while. That's cool. Uh, what have we been listening to, Joey? What about you here lately? What you been jamming? <clears throat> uh, I was jamming this fucking badass fucking like black and thrash band called Evil, and the album's called Possessed by Evil. Cool. Go fucking check that. It's streaming. Fucking really, really good band. Uh, in the car, I got Carnifloor and Gulfed in Gold. Which is some fucking Norwegian just fucking slam, wigger slam dude, it, shit. That's what we were listening to on the way. Yeah, it's yeah, fucking awesome. It's fucking dude. good shit. Like cool. fucking the homies from Cranium and shit. Uh, I listened to Zillikami fucking busting out some rap shit. And then I, I for a while there, I, I've taken it out now. But for a while, I was talking about it before, I had the Voivod Dimension Hatros in the car. And I was still jamming that for a while. It was just fucking awesome album yeah. but it made me think of something real fast that fucking when i had first moved uh from connecticut out here to illinois like i had already been listening to fucking metal and shit by that point fucking napalm death and right you know venom and fucking whatever slayer for sure exodus and whatever so when i moved out here to illinois uh you know i met a couple homies they fucking listened to fucking metal one of them was joe crap and shit you know and, uh the the homie tyler gain like he when i before i fucking knew who he was like i didn't hang out in the same fucking clique as him at all like i hung out with all the skaters and shit and he was like a he came from the country club so he had money his parents were lawyers and shit so to us he was just like a prep and shit but 
actually that motherfucker was like really cool and like totally into fucking badass metal and shit That's and cool. fucking uh he started skating with us and we all became friends you know and we all hung out but anyway i remember like the first time i ever went to his house like we stayed the night and shit me and a couple of my buddies and i brought some of my tapes you know what i'm saying so we could jam and he was already listening to fucking like whatever broken hope and fucking cannibal yeah, corpse fucking yeah. Yeah. Oh, wow, he was yeah. into death metal and shit which was cool you know what i'm saying like yeah. i was getting into it at the same time but one of the tapes i brought over was voivod nothing face and i remember i played that shit and like dude it just wasn't their thing at the time you know what i'm <laughs> right, saying right. but like, they fucking wrote me about that shit so fucking much talking <laughs> shit about that shitty ass band i played and it was voivod nothing which <laughs> oh, you know wow. now in retrospect they'd be like oh you know that's fucking Right, decent. Yeah, old school, but back yeah. then, you know, it's like fuck that shit. And dude, they, <laughs> just as kids, they talk so much shit. Anyway, so I, yeah, thinking about the boy vibe made That's me think cool. about that. That's cool, Chris. What about you, man? Uh, I was listening to some goddamn waking the cadaver today. The fucking new one, fucking uh, what is it? Control under deception. I can't remember what it's called, but I was listening to that today. I don't know other shit. Fucking goddamn deeds of flesh. I was listening, to jamming some deeds of flesh the other day. It's fucking awesome. Fuck yeah. Oh, and fucking cock and ball torture. Oh, there you go. Uh, I've been jamming some in Malice's Wake, man. I just uh, got on a little Australian kick listening to some Harlot. And then also that new Generation Kill just came yeah. out called MK Ultra. Uh, I listened to it once through. I thought it was good. I uh, wasn't blown away by it, but I was listening to it at kind of a lower volume. Yeah. So I wouldn't mind hearing it kind of cranked fucking up. Loud. And yeah, you got to See what it it's loud. about. Love, but that just came out. Love. So that's Rob Duke's uh, band. And uh, we had him on the show and talking about his band, Generation Kill. So check that out, MK Ultra. And all the dudes are, I can't remember who's it. Is it fucking Matt Harvey or Terry Butler? They're all doing that Left to Die band. I saw to die, that. Yes. Yeah, the death. Yeah. So I thought that the was The guys cool. from death. Dude, I would love to fucking... Check That'd be that badass. Shit. Doing the whole leprosy album, fucking, mm -hmm. and then songs off of spiritual healing too, right? Yeah, Isn't that right. What I said? Right. Yeah, dude, that'd be so fucking badass to see. Yeah, that's cool. Rick Roz and who else was? I can't remember who else. Was Terry there. Butler, and, yeah. yeah, the bass player. I thought Matt Harvey was involved. Maybe. You might be right. Yeah. I'm not sure. All right, um, I'm going to be doing the feature next episode and i'm going to be doing that on corrosive that's a band from toronto that i interviewed and so we'll have a little interview clip from that episode Fuck so yeah. that's cool uh we've been talking about that 666 club patreon guys. support that's the way you could support what we're doing because it's not free to do this it costs money to post these po podcasts we broke motherfuckers yo yeah and <laughs> you know we get people sending us pop tarts we appreciate that we got people <laughs> dropping off honey oil Oh, and that's yeah. always nice, Appreciate but that. we could use your three bucks a month <laughs> and help us pay the bills. So, so thank you to everybody that is a Patreon supporter. And if you're not, there's a link in the episode description. Again, it's only three bucks. You get the episodes early, you get karaoke early, 10% off of merch, the person, bonus content that nobody else hears. The person dropping off the honey oil is a member too, ain't he? He is, yeah. See, so that's like, he doubled up. That's right. right. So and he's yeah. been in here. Like, we have guests come yeah. in sometimes. So join that show. We've had 666 Clubbers in here we have. on oh, the yeah. show. Yeah. Uh, Rebecca, uh, Shane, um, you know, all members of that 666 Club. 666 Seal Clubbers. All right. Uh, I think we have done plenty of metal tonight. So, Chris, what the fuck do we need to do? We need to get our mayhem on.
tired of being cooped up in the house during this pandemic? Do the holidays got you down because you can't see your grandma in Florida? Well, you can play Press the Witch and just press those blues away. Here at Built and Madly, we've come up with a great way to have some fun with the family by picking one person to be pressed to death with thousands of pounds of boulders. Make them die before the buzzer goes off and get a bonus. Swim the Witch card, where you can tie up and toss an extra player in the bathtub for bonus points. Hey, Santa, can you get me pressed the Witch for Christmas? Of course, Timmy. You've been a good little fucker this year. <laughs> Gee golly, thanks, Santa. You're the shit. Get Press the Witch by Bill and Madly this Christmas and press your stress away. Boulder sold separately. <laughs> I forgot about that. Dude, oh, dude, that's man. fucking great. Press Holy the Witch. Shit. That was great for our witchcraft episode. Oh, yeah. That was hilarious. <laughs> All three of us got again. in on that. That's fucking hilarious. Chris, your little kid voice is just too funny. <laughs> All right, very good. And then before that, of course, brutal shit from Waco Jesus. I live for this shit was the track. Yeah, oh, yeah. yeah. The sex, drugs, and death metal. Very, very brutal. Joey, awesome job with that one. Very cool that you're keeping with that Illinois theme and the bands. And yeah. That's cool. Very cool. All right, well, Mayhem, we're in Mayhem, and uh, we got a little bit of Mayhem to t- share. Joey, you want to go first? Yeah, I'll go first. So, go ahead. I got a short one. Yeah, I was thinking about it the other day, like, uh, <clears throat> I wasn't thinking about the Mayhem stories, but something came up where it fucking made me think of one of my songs I did way back, and, like, it was the inspiration, you know, the what happened gave me the inspiration to write the song or whatever. Cool. All right. And I was sitting there, I was like, man, that's a, like an untapped fucking gold mine of mine that there's probably at least five or six good mayhem stories. From just your in, song? From you songs, songs that I, yeah, there's right. some good ones in there. Creepy but anyway, in the corridor. Yeah. So this is one of them right here, kind of. Um, like if anybody listens to Gormonger off my first time, I had a song called uh, Piss Drunk in a Snowbank. We're about to be in a snowbank. Chris is about to be pissed drunk, so like yeah, the the, su- <laughs> the stars are aligning. But uh, so what happened? Uh, this is in the Voth, and if I told this, I'm sorry, but I don't give a fuck. You're gonna hear it anyway. But this happened in the Voth, where of course you know bitches be skiing, and yeah. it's all it's all about them winter oh, yeah. activities them right winter. now. <laughs> uh, but this fucking dude whose fucking family it was like everybody knew him because they fucking got a ton of kids. One of his families just got like fucking, you know, for 10 years of high school, there's a got a kid in every fucking grade. Right, there's you, just a bunch of right? them. So, and the motherfuckers go hang out at these people's house too. So over the years, everybody knew this fucking place. You know what right. I'm saying? So uh, one of the kids, he's, he's in high school. Fucking parents are gone or whatever. He's fucking throwing a party over there. And fucking it's cold, like. You know, colder than what it is right now for us. Fucking just at straight, the moment, yeah. yeah, yeah, straight winter in rural Illinois. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So they're out there. Fucking Forest is a town, twelve hundred people. If people ain't listening, don't know. It's fucking nothing. So they're out there on the edge of the town, fucking hanging out. The fucking younger, you know, the kid who's throwing the party's got a fucking older brother who's now a fucking county cop. He's not now a county cop at this time. I'm telling the story. He was a county cop. Then, okay. Yeah, and fucking, he, like, he's fresh on the fucking scene. Like, he just fucking started being this shit, you know what I'm oh, saying? wow. And everybody knows him, too, you know? Like, I knew, everybody knew. And fucking, they're like, man, it would be funny as fuck to have him just come fucking roll up in here fucking flashing the lights. And scare everybody, you know what I'm saying? Dude. Right. So that's what they did. They fucking set it up, had him come in to this party, roll in, fucking, no you know, flashing lights, everything else. <laughs> well, this one kid fucking, you know, he fucking jumps out of the fucking hot tub and he's fucking freaking out. He's like, oh shit, the fucking cops are here. All right. And he fucking takes off all an ass across this cornfield because a mile and a half down the way, his fu- I think his sister lived over there. They he had just got out the fucking goddamn hot tub. He just got out of the fucking tub. hot tub. And he fucking runs and fucking, he never made it. They found him, I think, fucking, uh, you know, 100 yards from his fucking sister's house, fucking in a snowbank, fucking froze to death. For, for, yeah. Oh, my God. I, I, probably hypothermia. 
But anyway, wow. that was a fucking crazy ordeal. And of course, the yeah. fucking dude, I think they told him, they forced him to resign, is what it ended up happening. Oh, so boy. he wasn't a cop anymore. But no, fucking. So then I wrote the song Piss Drunk in a Snowbank, and that's what that song's about. So oh, wow. That fucking tale. So. That's a good one. Hell that's yeah. a good one. Mine's a little sillier, not quite as brutal as that, dying in a snowbank. It was a dark one, honestly. Yeah. But, but no, so it's a good story. This yeah. is a funny one from when I was a kid. My sister's four years younger than me. And so we had this thing. I don't know what started it. I don't know why. But whoever was the one to open the butter, like for the first time. Like take the lid off of the butter? Yeah, take the, but the lid off and get that first, you know, stab at the butter. That was like a thing, you know. Why? That you started the butter. I don't know. It was okay. a fucking show and dominance shit. I guess. <laughs> like, so anyway, my sister that's fucked up. had a thing of butter. We were getting ready to open it, and she opens it, and she's like all excited, and I was on one end of the table, and I <laughs> dove over the table with my knife and got and it the butter <laughs> and fucking licked it off the fucking knife <laughs> and my sister's like screaming mom you motherfucker peter started the butter <laughs> <laughs> it was my turn that's yeah. fucking insane <laughs> yeah it's fucking ridiculous so the other night i'm cooking pancakes for dinner and I opened the butter, and I told Jenny, I'm like, oh, wow, I can't believe I'm starting the butter. I get to start the butter. <laughs> so I'm like, I should take a picture of this and send it to my sister, you know? She's like, yeah, that'd be funny. <coughs> so I went and got my camera, and I did that and posted right. it on Facebook. And my mom commented and said, every single time I open a new thing of butter, I always think of you two fools. <laughs> yeah, Because that That's was perfect, a thing. Dude. It was hilarious. That's so. fucking awesome. perfect. So yeah, I started the butter over the weekend, so. Starting the butter. That's right. That's right. All right. And it's funny, too, because my sister's a chef, so I'm sure she started a lot more butter than I ever had. I bet. A whole lot. Yeah. All right. Very good. Some fun uh, mayhem tales for it's tonight. It's funny as fuck, though. Starting now the we butter. Got... <laughs> it's fucking... so random. Uh, we got this killer cage match to do tonight, Hell guys. Yeah. We love doing these. We take a list of 75 killers, 75 objects, 15 variables to make it interesting. We throw them all in a cage, but our listeners provide random numbers so we know who's Is fighting it? and got, what they're fighting with. What do we got to thank? Yeah, so our Chris. listeners we have right now, we got Bo Keating, Rebecca Boomsack, and Laura Kovac. So thank you all very much. Hell yeah. Hell Once yeah. Once again. Thank you guys. And we got a good one tonight, Joey. Who is fighting to death in the steel cage? Well, first off, we have Sick Ripper. <laughs> That's not who we have. Not Skin Ripper. No, I did. I I wanted to get it right. <laughs> no, but we got a uh, son of Sam David Berkowitz, and he's fighting against Tommy Karate. Oh, That's yeah. all I'm saying. That's all I'm saying. Yeah. My uh, lips are shut. <laughs> I, ain't, I ain't a rat. <laughs> they uh, they got a couple of objects, Chris. What are they fighting with? Uh, they got themselves a metal folding chair, just a regular cage match fight. Fucking boom, right. get it in. And a gun that shoots <laughs> ghost pepper hot sauce. Ouch. That could Ew. be nasty. That's not going to feel good in the eyeballs. No, it's not. And the variable tonight is bubbles from the Trailer Park Boys with a horrible case of the crap. See, that variable right there, man. Yeah, bubbles <laughs> freaking out. That episode is fucking hilarious. All right, well, what do we think, Chris? So we got uh, Tommy Karate, Son of Sam, with a metal folding chair and a gun that shoots hot That's pepper a lot sauce. To put together. Ghost pepper sauce and bubbles from oh, the Trailer Park freaking Boys. Out. He's itching. getting the ghost pepper hot sauce. He's probably shooting himself with it, trying to kill the fucking goddamn crabs. He's like, I'm burning <laughs> these motherfuckers off. I don't care. And then Berkowitz is pissed off. It doesn't shoot 40 cows, but like. It's hot sauce. He didn't get the gun. Goddamn Tommy Karate just fucking kicks the shit out of him, takes the folding chair, fo stands it up, sits down and smokes a cigar. Nice. Nice. Okay. Yeah, Joey, what about what you, man? I mean, I, I straight up, you know, sometimes we just say like that Tommy Karate is going to whoop David Berkowitz's oh, fat yeah. ass probably. Oh, yeah. yeah. Tommy I mean, was in great shape. He was a fucking martial yeah. artist, which is why they called him right. that. So Tommy would fuck his yeah. world up. But if, if I'm going to go with uh, what we got going on here, I think fucking 
Now Berkowitz, he's going to grab the gun that she was going to Pepper Sauce because Berkowitz just grabs the gun. He That's likes what he the does. gun. Yeah. <clears throat> Tommy Crotty is like, okay, he grabs that fucking folding chair and he fucking holds it up as a fucking shield. Right. And fucking, you know, David Berkowitz is just sitting there like, <laughs> just shooting. <laughs> and eventually he's going to run out of fucking hot, hot sauce because yeah. the fucking dog didn't tell him to fucking stop shooting the stupid motherfucking right, thing. Right. So Tommy Crotty basically, <laughs> he just nice. outlasts him with the fucking chair, takes the chair fucking throws it off in the corner grabs bubbles fucking whip crabs it oh, all wow. and proceeds to use bubbles to fucking he just beats fucking uh berkowitz with bubbles with bubbles <laughs> swinging him around yeah holy oh, wow. shit yeah Damn. and he kills fucking okay. both of them <laughs> like no, at that I don't point, know if he's gonna kill fucking. He might like bubbles. All right, all right. <laughs> I don't want to. I don't want to say anything about. I wasn't with you guys on the episode about Tommy no, Crotty, no. but I know the fucking situation. Yeah, <laughs> and I don't want any angry emails. No, we don't need that. And Tommy, you so know, Tommy, he's a, you he's win, a badass man. I think he's fucking Berkowitz up. I don't give a shit if Berkowitz has the gun with the hot pepper sauce, the chair, his dick, whatever. Tommy Karate's fucking him up spinning fucking back kicks just gonna kick his ass and bubbles i think with this itching and freaking out i think tommy is probably just gonna knock him out with the chair just to shut him the fuck up right and then probably like you said chris hang back maybe drink a you know scotch and uh like, smoke a up? cigar you know all right. Well, we always love doing some killer cage match are always fun so thanks again to our listeners that uh you know, help us out picking that uh, match up. All right. We have been talking about our YouTube channel. Uh, if you're a subscriber, you already know we've been posting some videos there. Some uh, interviews we've done with uh, John from Votov. Um, we did um, uh, the guys from Corrosive. That one's getting ready to post here in a couple weeks. Uh, did the one with Teresa Lancaster from The Keepers. Uh, there's some good ones on there. So go to our YouTube channel. You can link to that in the episode description and click on that and go subscribe. Doesn't cost you a damn thing. Hell and no. then you know when we're posting content. So don't miss out on that. Don't miss out. Fuck don't no. miss out. Sick Ripper. Yeah, Sick Ripper. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, I think we have done plenty of mayhem tonight. So I think it's time to hit the fucking outro. Fuck yeah, man. Angelus Apatrida and the song Indoctrinate from oh, yeah. their self-titled album from last year. Love those guys from Spain. Kicking total fucking ass. Always. Yeah, I really dig those guys. Bumper music tonight. Waco Jesus, Angelus Apatrida, and in Malice's Wake. Fucking brutal fucking three bands, Hell I'll yeah. tell you. They're nonstop. Brutality, yeah, good dude. mix, too, of types of metal, which yeah. is always good. Uh, metal segment intro music, Joey, is by who? Chrysix. Fuck yeah. And Chris, our Murder Metal Mayhem Metal intro. Fucking 12, what the fuck? You know it. Uh, thanks to everybody out there listening. We we really appreciate it because we jumped up to 3,600 total listens this week, which is really awesome. So we do appreciate that very much. And Chris, we want to read a few of the comments. What's that yeah, first got, one? Uh, Peppermint Patty 69. Okay. All right. How's it going? <laughs> but for real, it says, uh, I love listening to you guys when I'm cleaning the house. My boyfriend likes it, but he's not into metal as I am. Listening in Daleks. 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 Dallas. Daleks. <laughs> Hell yeah. Thanks, Peppermint Patty. Listening there in Dallas. Cleaning the house. Daleks, bro. Fuck yeah. Joey, what about the second one? Uh, Dave Kilgore commented, uh, I just found you guys on Spotify. Holy shit, I have a shit ton of episodes to catch up on. My buddy told me about you a while ago, and I heard the Cleveland Strangler episode. Now I'm fucking hooked. Cool. That was Fuck a good yeah. episode to fucking hear. Yeah, thanks, Dave. That's awesome. Brenda Rawlington, 88, commented, Hey, guys, I'm a listener in Toronto. 
I love the Votov interview, and now I hear you doing one with my other favorite Canadian band, Corrosive. Hails to you. So awesome, okay, Brenda. Man. That's great. Got a lot of Canadian listeners. Uh, Winnipeg, number two city listening right behind Chicago. So thank you very much. And then, Chris, what about that last one? I don't got Christo, get the foreign or, name here. I know, right? He's going to say it. Arturo Russia. Gomez says, I'm a listener from Mexico City since 2020. You guys are great. I'm from El Paso, but moved here a few years ago from work. It's nice to hear all the metal and serial killers every week. The Clipper Dolphins episode was sick. Keep having Shane on those Canadian episodes. Yeah, and we definitely plan to do that. Hell yeah. I've already. Uh... I touched base with them about the next one. I'd like to do um, the uh, the one that you mentioned, Joey, that Alan. Alan Legere. Yeah, oh, Legere. That's yeah. brutal. That's a sick one, and definitely like to have Shane on for that. So, All right, check out MurderMetalMayhem.com to listen to all the past episodes. You can like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, and subscribe to that YouTube channel. Uh, we get some exciting things coming to the channel, so don't miss out. Subscribe today. Uh, check out the show everywhere you can. I mean, leave you comments. Anywhere you get podcasts. Yeah, anywhere. let us you know know what you think and leave comments so other people know what you think. We really appreciate that. Support the show and join that 666 Club, patreon.com slash murder metal mayhem. Join for only three bucks a month. And one listener, guys, gave us 666 a month. Fuck yeah. Nice. How about that? So that's, that's fucking awesome. cool as hell. So thank you. That's six dollars and sixty six cents, not six hundred and sixty six. Because I don't know what we would do for that kind of money. I mean, you know, that would be pretty cool. Uh, <laughs> you can buy my books at creationofchaos dot com if you like those horror type novels, uh, scary shit, um, horror, suspense, thrillers. Uh, Creation of Chaos Three is a collection of short stories. I did an audio book. You can go to Audible, iTunes, or Amazon. And check the episode description for a link to that. Uh, we can't let him go without hearing a karaoke song. I was busy this week and out of town, but this song fits the sit this episode perfectly. So crank it the fuck up, and until next time, keep one foot in the gutter and your other hand holding the horns high. Sick ripper. <laughs> Sick ripper. <laughs>
yeah, here comes Bad girl, you said girl, you're such a naughty bad girl Ha ha Bad girl, you said girl, you're such a naughty bad girl Ha ha Now you and me, we're both the same But you call yourself by different names now your mama won't like it when she finds out Girl is out at night